Hi, so today you're joined with Tracy and Dan from Impacto Consulting, and we're really happy to say that we also have David Panter here from ECH joining us. So welcome to the podcast, David. Thanks. Great. Um, I'd love to just sort of kick off today with you telling us a little bit more about, I guess, yourself, and also if you can just share a little bit about ECH with everybody listening as well. Great. Very happy to do that. Um, So I have been involved one way or another in health and social care for about 42 years now, um, both in the UK and here in Australia. Uh, And for about 26, 27 of those, I've been a chief exec of different organisations. So originally in the National Health Service in the UK, and then I went on to run a large uh, bit of, the, of local government, the city of Brighton and Hove on the south coast of England. Mm-hmm. And local government in the UK is very different to local government here in Australia because we actually ran everything. Oh, <laughs> so wow. schools, public housing, oh, as well wow. as things like rubbish collection, social care, aged care, child protection. Um, so local government is a big, more like the state government in some respects um, in the UK. Uh, and then I was headhunted over to Adelaide in 2004 when the then RAM government had did a, uh, were reforming the public hospital system and wanted to bring somebody into a leadership role that came from a more diverse background than many of the health people in Australia who tend to only have worked in hospitals. Mm-hmm. And, and I've run big teaching hospitals in London, but I've also set up the UK's first primary care trust for GPs. I've, I say, run local government and social care. So was brought in t- in order to help the reform process um, back in the early 2000s. Um, and that quickly gave birth to the new Royal Adelaide Hospital. So a number of my years was taken leading that project for the state government and the Samway building, those sorts of things. Um, and um, most recently, seven years ago now, moved to ECH. And I decided to apply for the chief exec position here at ECH because they were at a critical turning point after 50 odd years of history in the aged care market. Um, they wanted to transform themselves away from residential aged care to focus entirely on providing housing and home care to people as they age, um, to be able to keep them living independently at home for as long as possible. And so that's the transformation journey I've had the privilege of leading here at ECH over the last almost seven years now. It's a pretty exciting transformation. It's it's a bold move to, to pivot in that way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the board at the time, I think, could see the writing on the wall in terms of Mm -hmm. what people themselves wanted in Mm -hmm. terms of support as they age, increasingly to be able to stay at home. And I knew from my experience in in the UK that Australia is way behind other developed countries in terms of the sort of home care that can be provided and is successfully provided elsewhere. And I'm only just beginning to do things here at ECH that I was doing in London 25 years ago. (laughs) So we've got a lot of catching up to do. Um, So... But the board did see the real potential, I say, to, to move away from residential aged care. So we sold that arm of the business. Um, and, and we're a, a not-for-profit, which means basically that any profit we make goes back into our benevolence. So, you know, we probably sold our residential care arm. Um, we had 1,200 licensed beds in 11 different facilities. At, it's probably at the peak of its value. Um, Mm. seven years ago Um, and some of those resources that we gained through that sale has what has then been able to support our innovation and development program as we've begun the transformation process. Yes which is really what we're excited to hear more about so um, and you know I've seen a couple of your innovations that I was really excited about namely Billy and Dandelion so do you want to just start off by telling us a little bit more about both of those? Yeah, I mean, so Billy um, started life as an independent startup that we chose to invest in because we saw its potential. Um, It's a home monitoring system that uses uh, movement sensors, just standard off the shelf uh, movement sensors from Samsung. Um, We position about six of those in somebody's home. And it's not an emergency system. It's actually about trying to understand their day-to-day behavior routines and patterns and then looking for deviations from those patterns 
as an early indication of some sort of change that might need a change in support. So the most obvious example I give is that you know we um, always put one um, in the main toilet area, um, so we know how many times somebody's going to the toilet a day, mm-hmm. um, and we're not interested just in how many times they go. We're interested in what their baseline you know, the t- number is of going to the toilet. So particularly overnight, do they go once a night, twice a night? Because if we see that stepping up and increasing, mm-hmm. that is a good indication of a urinary tract infection. Mm-hmm. And a urinary tract infection is the, fir- is the one of the biggest um, issues which, if unchecked, lead to people becoming dizzy and having a fall and breaking their hip. Wow. And so if we can spot that through somebody's toileting behavior, that change, and intervene then to test for a urinary tract infection, rather than wait for them to get the full-blown infection and fall over and break their hip. And that's the sort of principle that Billy brings. It's about prediction and being able to intervene to stop things from happening to somebody. Um, And it also comes with a really good app interface for family so that, and they don't get all that data, but they get um, meaningful data about those daily living activities. So for example, they'll be able to look in real time and see, oh yeah, mum's got up today. Um, Mum's had a breakfast. Now we don't know whether mum has eaten her breakfast, but we certainly know whether she's opened her fridge. Um, at a certain time in the morning, and that's like you know, the best indicator that we've had that she's got a breakfast. We can put a motion sensor on a pillbox so we can see whether she's taken her medications. And all that information does go through in real time to the family members. So they can just look at their app and see, oh, green tip, mum's up. Don't need to worry about her today. Um, so we just saw the real potential for Billy in being able to support what we're about, which is living independently at home for longer. Um, and the opportunity came for us to acquire Billy rather than to keep reinvesting. And so we did that a year or so ago. And then that also brought into the organisation the um, skill set of that entrepreneurial startup. Mm. So that was the sort of, that's where we, that's what Billy is and that's why we were so interested. Dandelion is very different. Dandelion's our own um, creation, um, and it's the Dandelion Care Hotel, um, and it's creating a home away from home for people who are being supported at home, but may go through periods where they need slightly higher levels of care or observation or support. And we see at the moment that those people often end up going into hospital when it's not really necessary to go into hospital. And then a whole lot of other stuff happens that potentially sets them on a downhill trajectory. Um, you know, just lying in a hospital bed, not doing every you know, daily living activities has a big impact, even after 24 hours, on your muscle mass and your ability to get out of bed. And so we wanted to create a home away from home environment. So we've used that hotel culture and concept. So it's not a hospital. It's not a residential aged care city. It is a hotel. Um, and you can check in as a guest to the hotel from one night to a number of nights. And while you're there, we can provide that closer observation, closer support the, in a more affordable way than it could be provided in your own home. You know, absolutely. We could put a carer in your home 24-7. But the Mm -hmm. cost of that would be astronomical and unaffordable for most people. Whereas you can check into the care hotel for a couple of hundred dollars a night, which can be paid for out of their home care package. And because we've got a number of people in the staying in the hotel, we can staff that accordingly and do those various checks. But to facilitate that, we've also then again paired with a number of technology companies to test out um, some really interesting cutting edge technology. So we're using, you know, for people living with dementia, rather than having locks and keys to keep them safe if they're wanderers, uh, we're using facial recognition technology. Um, We are using um, a radar technology that um, a company have produced um, as a falls indicator. And so by putting a simple um, sensor on the ceiling in the middle of the room, our sort of hotel concierge can see whether somebody has fallen over in their room. Um, We can't 
it's not a camera, we're not actually physically seeing, but it's the radar technology is able to detect that form. So we're, we're again using the Dandelion Hotel as a way of testing out other bits of, of new technology because they themselves may also be useful in people's own homes mm. if developed appropriately. I love that. Um, I love the idea that it's not a camera uh, and that it's a, the that you've got the sensors. Um, I did some work a while ago uh, with looking at, at cameras and and. Um, whilst people love the idea of having cameras in their home when they're not home to watch their pets, um, <laughs> many people aren't comfortable having cameras in their home actually watching them and their activity. So it's great that you've sort of giving people that dignity whereby they can be safe, but they also have their privacy. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we're sort of founded in terms of our basic policies on a, from a human rights perspective. And so the self-determination, people being in control of their own lives and being able to make decisions about what sort of services and care they receive is critical. And clearly, privacy issues uh, are paramount within that as well. And, and therefore, absolutely, we that's what excited us about Billy was we'd seen some other technology from overseas that did similar, but was camera-based. Um, mm. And even with Billy, we have a partnership with close working with Samsung where we get the um, sensors from. You know, and they, they showed us as what they described as a movement sensor that was more sophisticated. Um, but it really was a camera that gave a blurry image. Uh -huh. um, and we weren't happy with that either. So um, movement sensors for us are a much more appropriate way of doing um, the support that we need to do to be consistent with that human rights approach. And it sounds like a real win-win. Um, you know, we want to keep people safe, but we also have to respect people's rights and their privacy, right? Okay. Whereas sometimes in the past, when there's that been that paternalistic type view, you know, it's very, very much like we've got to keep these people safe and at any cost, you know, and there is a balance. And I think it seems like you've really struck that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a constant sort of balancing act. Um, and unfortunately, you know, there's clearly a lot of concern about the safety issues and they're often raised by the family you know we've seen a lot of that writ large out of the royal commission into aged care um, and you know often that can be justified but equally we do have to be careful that just because you're you're becoming older doesn't mean that you still can't make decisions for yourself you can't decide what risks you're prepared to live with Mm -hmm. um, I would make it clear to all our staff as part of their induction, you know, we can go into somebody's home and we can point out that that lovely rug on the floor is a trip hazard. But our job is just to point that out. We mm -hmm. can't take the rug away. We can't nail it down. And that rug may bring huge meaning to that individual's life because they mm -hmm. may have got it from an overseas you know, trip or holiday. Mm -hmm. It has huge sentimental value, whatever. And it's their right to make that dis informed decision. Yeah, I know it's a trip hazard, but I love it. And so I still want it there. And if I fall over it, well, there are consequences, but I was aware of those. To me, it's more important to have the rug there. And so when you scale that up to talk about broader sort of health issues, mm -hmm. um, it gets can get quite fraught um, in terms of some of those, getting that right balance between preserving somebody's dignity and their rights versus making sure that we are encouraging safe practice. Yeah. Um, so uh, we we sort of heard a bit of the, the history that sits behind both both Billy and Dandelion, but I'm interested because you said that uh, with Billy you brought that entrepreneurial um, capability into your organisation. So how does that uh, I guess, how does that work? You've got a, uh, a not-for-profit that's been around for 50 years and you've also got that entrepreneurial um, capability within the organisation. Is, is that a happy marriage or yeah, does it <laughs> create some, some of that real positive tension that, that is where often really cool things come from? Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, it's, it's part of the overall transformational journey. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, we've actually been going 57 years this year Wow. Um, six years ago, about a year after I arrived, we did the sort of brand rebranding, the re, you know, sort of bit of the transformation in order to set a different tone for the organisation. Um, we were, you know, we're actually not a denominational organisation, but 
prior to my arrival, the outside world would have thought we were denominational because mm-hmm. we were so conservative <laughs> in yeah. how we reacted and behaved. Um, we, in 57 years, I'm the third chief exec. The wow. first was around for 30 odd years, the next one for 20, and I've now been here for seven. Um, and, you know, I, I don't intend to be here after 10 <laughs> um, <laughs> because I do believe that you've got to have that change in leadership from the top to get the right sort of culture. And so um, part of, you know, it just was a huge privilege for me to be given the freedom of my board to say, yep, yeah, we want to transform. We mm-hmm. want to be seen as more radical. We want to be seen as more innovative and cutting edge. We want to be seen as sort of the modern folk on the block rather than the traditionists. Um, and you know, there was a lot of pain in the early days. So you know, I inherited an executive team of three lovely people, mm-hmm. but they were you know, three white middle-aged men who came to work in suits and ties every day. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't wear a suit and tie. I haven't for years. Um, but it took me you know, a good six months to enable those individuals to realise that they didn't need to wear a shirt and tie into the office mm-hmm. every day. Um, and, you know, and that's led the way for the whole of the organisation. Ha- and to me, the what keeps us on track in that process, though, is a complete focus on the needs of our clients. So for me, you know, not wearing a shirt and tie every day is not because I just don't want to wear a shirt and tie and a suit. It's actually that I spend a lot of my time out meeting and talking with our clients, and I have found that dress a barrier to having a conversation that's meaningful with the client. Because as soon as you appear in a suit and a shirt and a tie, then they pigeonhole you into, oh, you, you must be a bureaucrat, you're, you know, whatever. Whereas if they see me turn up in a polo shirt and jeans and see my tattoos and earrings, and it's just like, well, who's this guy? Oh, you're the chief exec. Oh, we didn't know. <laughs> yeah. So, and it's the same with the staff. So, so for me, that's all part of the culture. And, if, and what we spent a lot of time doing was looking at what clients were experiencing looking at what was stopping them from staying, living at home independently longer. So if somebody left home to go to residential care, seeing that as a failure on our part, could we have done something differently? Mm. And getting the whole of the organisation, again, one of my little stories I say induction is, chief execs often get themselves in a situation where they believe they're the font of all good ideas. Mm -hmm. And I can absolutely assure people I have 100 good ideas every day. But I've learned over my time to surround myself with colleagues who have the confidence to say, yeah, David, you think that's a good idea. It's a pile of crap. (laughs) And actually, most of the good ideas come from a whole range of staff. You know, it's our frontline staff who are interacting every day with our clients. They've got a much better understanding of some of the barriers and what might help those individuals than I have. I've got some know-how as to how to take that information and then turn it into an opportunity, mm. into an innovation. But the ideas are across the whole of the organisation. And so you know, that's the sort of etiology, if you like, of, of how we often innovate is about how do we capture the good ideas and then how do we apply internal resources to the ideas we think they are the best to test out, to work out whether they are going to be a real benefit and if so, then how do you bring them up to scale within the organisation? Um, and so we are a very different organisation to seven years ago. Those three men in suits, as I've got them out of their suits, but they've all gone off to do other things. Um, we now have a very diverse um, leadership as well as workforce overall, um, much more reflective of the communities that we serve. Um, it's fascinating that you know, we went decided to go down the rainbow tick accreditation process, which organisations can do, any sorts of organisations can do, to demonstrate their inclusiveness to the LGBTIQ plus community. Um, And we decided to do that because we knew there were older LGBTI members out there that were not accessing services. 
Um, but as part of that process, and that's that took us you know, a good 18 months, two years to go through all the accreditation steps to get the rainbow flag recognition. Um, but once we, we did, we also saw, not surprisingly, that we were attractive for more staff coming from that community. And so we went from our, you know, our LGBTI staff have gone from being about 2% to now about 15% of our organisation. Um, right. and, and that's because of that process. Um, and likewise, as we started to work more with First Nation communities, we've seen a change in First Nation community members wanting to come and work for us. And that's, I'm just focusing on that because for me, that's part of the innovation. Mm. It's you've got to get different voices. You've got to get different ref, different reflections into an experience, into the organisation. And then you get some really exciting stuff out of that mix of culture and mix of experience. I agree. You, you're really opening yourself up to a broad range of ideas and philosophies and perspectives because you've got a really broad range of people who are looking at the same situation through a totally different lens. No, absolutely. That's right. It's just so important. And it has to be, I think the other thing which I would observe is you've also got to be authentic about it. And again, I've seen organisations who pay lip service to, say, diversity, um, but there's no authenticity behind it. And therefore, um, that quickly shows and you yeah. don't get the sort of benefit that um, you hoped you were going to. And so I think there's got to be a real sort of commitment and enthusiasm and authenticity from the very top of the organisation um, if you're going to get the real traction that you need to be an innovative organisation. Oh, I agree. And I love that because um, you know, I guess in the spirit of um, authenticity, you were talking about how you spend a lot of time talking to people um, and talking to the people that you support to understand what's important to them and what they need. Um, do you have any kind of formal program for collecting insights from people or is that just I guess, an organic part of everybody's day or how does that work there? So we have the sort of the four part, sorry, the, the, the two different components. The I require any of our staff who are not client facing mm -hmm. to shadow a client facing staff member at least every six months for a day. So you could be a finance person working in head office and you don't get to see our clients then you have to, once every six months, go out for a day with a personal carer going to somebody's home uh, and shadow them. And, and so that also applies to me. It applies to anybody who's not directly client-facing. So that's make sure everybody's got some familiarity. Um, we've then got formal structures. And so every time we go into exploring a new idea or a concept, we do that through a co-design process involving our clients we have a standing group called which is called our you know, lived experience group which any of our clients or their support network can volunteer to be on um, and so that usually is around about 30 to 40 people at any one time they might be people who are living in one of our houses they might be somebody who's getting home care they might be the partner of somebody living with dementia who's getting services from us um, and that group meets every six weeks and they elect their own chair and they run that half day workshop every six weeks. So they will have their own topics. But myself and, and management can say to that group, we'd like you to give you your feed, give us feedback on this idea or your thoughts. So you know, our um, tech development team ran a session a couple of weeks ago on a client app that we're developing and, and so they were able to put that into that conversation get some initial reactions to it etc etc um, and then from that group of lived experience folk um, a number of those then sit on our the rest of our executive structure um, and so again it means that in where we're making key decisions we've got direct lived experience from our clients impacting into that conversation. I love that. Yep. That's so good. <laughs> it is. So good. What what benefits have you found so far, David, around having that? I mean, how long has that been running for? And 
what have you seen come out of having that structure so set up? We've been doing that for the last sort of three or four years. Great. Um, and you know, it's, so it's where something like you know, the Dandelion Care Hotel starts to come to life. It's, um, we, some of those issues we talked about earlier between balancing safety versus you know, personal responsibility and control over your life, we test out, you know, so we've taken, for example, some of our, you know, because we are a regulated um, industry, and so we have the Safety and Quality Commission nationally that people can complain to, then, you know, we share those complaints with that group to say, well, what do you think we should have done differently? Particularly as we often get, you know, caught in some of those complaints, you're often caught as the sort of jam in the sandwich between what the older person themselves wants and what their family wants. Mm. You know, nobody's ever given me a hard time for helping their mum or dad to get to the supermarket to do their shopping because they can't, you know, they've got mobility issues. But I have a stack of complaints from people where we offer that same transport service to help somebody get to the pub on a Friday night. How dare you let my dad drink? You're encouraging him. He shouldn't be drinking at your at his age. It's like, no, sorry. He may be 83, but he's an adult. And actually, he enjoys going to the pub on a Friday night to watch the footy with his mates because that's how he keeps socially connected. Mm. So it's just as important as buying the food at the supermarket. Yeah. But sometimes family members don't agree with that. <laughs> Mm. Um, and so test using our lived experience group to test out some of our reactions again is a really good way of us just testing it out but also provides evidence then to us to give to the commission to say mm. well actually you know, our own lived experience members do believe it was an appropriate course of action that we took in this situation that's awesome um, so and then the other one that we've been spending a lot of time looking at is is housing solutions um, and particularly some work we've been doing with First Nation community elders around what sort of housing would be appropriate for them. Um, and interestingly, coming up with a really, I think, exciting group house model where what people from those communities are saying is we don't want the sort of housing that you've currently provided, like a one bedroom or a two bedroom unit that's on its own we would prefer to have a group house where we might have you know, half a dozen bedrooms with ensuite bathrooms, but shared living, dining, kitchen space, uh, because that's more appropriate for our culture and how we want to spend our time. And so that's beginning to help us think about our future building program if we're going to meet the needs of that particular community. It's so it's so important and so interesting as well, isn't it? Because all too often we apply the lens of what we would want over how we think is best to progress forward. But through that, um, talking to other people and talking to different people who have different perspectives, often you can actually come up with something that is a lot more exciting. Um, and I think that there's potentially some uh, opportunities to look at solutions like that to also deal with social um, you know, with, with people feeling socially isolated as well. So, you know, maybe some of those um, innovations that are suitable for one culture could actually expand out for other people who haven't necessarily thought about living in that way, but, you know, maybe would benefit from that community approach. No, that's absolutely right, because that's, that social connection issue is critical. It's, we sort of see it as being the glue that helps people stay embedded within their home and in their local community. Um, and it's often the reason given for why somebody might have decided to go to residential age care is that they're lonely mm -hmm. uh, and that somehow moving into you know, a residential care home with lots of people is going to stop you feeling lonely. And all too often, unfortunately, it doesn't because you're with people you wouldn't ordinarily mix with, you don't have the same interests. So again, that's the other area we've tried to innovate in. Um, so for example, at the moment, um, just getting it back on track post COVID is our um, walking footy initiative. And so for some time in the UK and elsewhere, walking versions of cricket and soccer um, have been there so that you can carry on playing a team sport, even though you can no longer run around quite as well as you used to. But nobody had done that in Australia for Aussie rules football. So we've partnered with Sample 
Um, and again, we worked with clients to develop what the rules were of walking footing. And so it works on a, a sort of a version of a, like a netball court with three zones, six aside, mixed gender. Interestingly, we had two thirds as many women as men coming forward during the prototyping. Lots of old netballers out there who still want to throw a ball around. Um, and you can kick, you can throw, you score goals. You just don't run. Um, and you work within the, different, the three zones. You can do different sorts of things. Um, and it just brings so much joy back into people's lives who've spent a whole lifetime playing a team sport. But it's also the social connection after the match. And so you know, one of the requirements out of the prototyping was that wherever you have the match, um, it's got to be near a coffee shop. So afterwards, you can then go and have a coffee. And so we're hoping with Sanfil that um, so we're just relaunching it because it did get knocked back by COVID. But the goal with Sanfil is to have a walking, at least one walking footy team associated with every club in Sanfil across the state um, so that we can then start to have a league of walking soccer. Walking footy, rather. So it's sort of, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like, um, it's really exciting. And I'm just, but you know, not giving any great secrets away, that was $20,000 of investment. Yeah, <laughs> It's not huge amounts of money. It's the idea and it's the willingness to do something differently um, and for Sanfil to want to partner with us. That's um, so cool. You know, and we're happy for them to have the IP and the license because we want it then to spread nationally. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it was about getting it off the ground so that, again, it was something else in our armory with regard to social connection for those who were interested in sport. I think it's great also because the people who are involved in creating that, like that's a fun thing to create too, isn't it? Like, you know, coming up with rules and setting up a game like that and, and and now they can potentially how long see it everywhere. Each quarter was whether it was going to be five minutes, ten minutes. Yeah, and we've literally got people from. Um, I can think of somebody called happens to be called David as well, um, who's in his early sixties, who you know, suffers an unfortunate stroke, through to people in their mid nineties playing. Wow. Yeah, but it's that level playing field, literally, that around the walking that enables them to work together and still be able to play a team game. That's so cool. It's a great, a great innovation. And that's, we often talk about this. A lot of people sometimes think innovation. They think when they hear innovation, sorry, they think it needs to be some sort of technology or something like that. And it can be like we've heard with some of your examples, but it also doesn't have to be. It can be a service. It can be and something you've organized. Um, it's all about though, creating something better and creating value for people, isn't it? And there's just so many different ways you can do that. Absolutely. I mean, for me, innovation is often just taking something that's been proven elsewhere and doing it here. Mm. You know, that's, that's the thing with walking footy. I knew that walking soccer and walking cricket worked, but we've just never done it here. Mm. The care hotel, the Dandelion Care Hotel, again, I've been involved in similar things overseas, but nobody's ever done it in Australia. So it's just taking somebody else's good idea and then applying it locally. Yeah. And that application is where you then need to do the prototyping and get the engagement because it does have to be fine-tuned to be a cultural fit with yeah. whatever group um, is going to make use of it. Yeah, I love that. All right. So, yeah, that, that, that was really helpful, David. Th thank you so much for spending some time with both Tracy and I today to talk about your journey and also some of the really exciting things you're doing at ECH. Just hearing about your focus on your clients and and how you're you know moving and changing your organisation to adapt to the emerging needs of the groups that you support is just really really um, you know music to our ears because you know we talk about this stuff a lot but it's so great to hear someone putting that into practice in at ECH so really appreciate your time today. Pleasure. Thank Thanks. you. And we'll, um, we'll put a link um, to the ECH website so that if you'd like to uh, read up or watch some videos and that sort of thing and learn more about ECH, you can. And it's very easy to find as well, both Dandelion and also the Billy initiatives on that website too, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about how they work. So thanks once again, David, and we'll see you all on the next episode.